infrastructure is crumbling and the problems are only getting worse. The pressure to find solutions is hot. Let's talk about why American cities have no water, no electricity, and no money to fix their infrastructure problems. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast, hosted by Chad Smelter. Hey, what's up, everybody? Hope you're having a great day. Wanted to share with you that the Infrastructure Hot Seat is in season two. Season one was amazing. I've learned a lot. We learned a lot from our guests. We had a lot of experience on the Infrastructure Hot Seat. Now we're in season two where we're going to spice it up a little bit. The first guest is Chris Evers, who's the pavement technology expert. He has 27 years in the industry. We talk about business development. We talk about AI. We talk about how the infrastructure industry is just changing over over the years and, and what what's coming up in the future. So hold on, because this is a great episode and I hope you enjoy it. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Infrastructure Network. My name is Chad Smeltzer. I am your host. Today's guest is Chris Evers, who's the co-founder of PWD Roundtable, executive coordinator for FPPC, technical representative at Pavement Technology, Inc. Thanks for joining me, Chris. Thanks for having me, Chad. Now, Chris, this is our second take because we had a little technical issues on the last time. Uh, That's it. We're doing this all again. <laughs> It's and always better the second time. I think so too. I think we're on a, a good path so far. Uh, a couple seconds into this uh, this episode, but the first thing we talked about in the first take that we did was we were talking about like business development and the you know selling products versus bringing value, value add, and stuff like that. So I yep. want to go back to that and kind of talk about that a little bit more because you've had experience with that kind of stuff before. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's what I've been doing the last 27 years really is, uh, you know, meeting with public works directors, city engineers, county engineers, DOT, uh, you know, officials, uh, all of those types of decision makers. And the thing that, uh, you know, I've taken away from that experience over the years is just you can't go in there immediately guns blazing, pitching your product, this, that. And the other and expect to have you know a lot of success it's really got to start from a place of you adding value and, and you really have to, to to understand how you can add value you have to know uh what it is they're uh, maybe challenged by what kinds of things could you uh, potentially help uh, with and hopefully there's a marriage between what you're offering and what they need help with uh, if there isn't it may not be a good fit and that's okay because the, the way i've always approached it is that at some point or the, in, or the other, uh, yeah. you and I are going to get to do business together. It doesn't have to be on an artificial timeline. If we see uh, enough uh, folks, if we go out and, and we're in the market and we're adding value, then that exchange is going to happen as long as we have something of value uh, yeah. to yeah. them. It has to be to them, too. I can't. It has nothing to do with what I think. It, it has everything to do with what they value. And so that's why it has to start there. I appreciate that. And I think that's a tip every business development person out there in the industry should use and absorb it and try and figure out how to provide value to their potential prospects, clients, and things like that. Even their partners they do business with, all yes. that stuff adds up. So I wanted to start off with the beginning episode, just talking about that. But now uh, I want to switch to a little bit more about you, Chris, and how you got into sure. infrastructure and like, where did this all start? It was a warm day in 1996. <laughs> uh, no, so I, I graduated from Oklahoma State University with a uh, marketing degree. And uh, really, you know, when I started, I didn't know anything about public works. I, I began my career with a company called uh, Coke Materials Company, an asphalt company, and I could barely spell asphalt. Uh, but what I did know is that it was going to be a place where yeah, I could really stretch my legs. I didn't know anything about it. So I was going to, you know, kind of hit the ground running, you know, kind of the drink from the fire hose. And from very early on, I could tell that this was just a, a great fit. Sometimes you get lucky. Uh, and so it was a great fit. Uh, everything that that I kind of learned about Public Works, I liked. I liked the ability to to go in and help with infrastructure. Infrastructure is just so vitally important in this country. Um, you know, it is the lifeblood uh, of our economy. It's the circulatory system for our society. And so everything moves over, you know, this infrastructure system that we're lucky enough to have. Uh, and it's really not luck. I mean, we've worked very, very hard over uh, decades uh, to, to, to build this. And so it's been my, you know, distinct pleasure to, to get a chance to 
uh, help educate folks on how they can preserve that infrastructure more effectively over over the long haul. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And one of the things I was looking at your background, you were the past president of APWA, um, which is uh, going back to what we just talked about, value and, and being involved in communities and, and being involved in organizations that are making a difference like APWA. So how did that come about? Well, that's uh, that's kind of a funny story, too. They all go around, uh, you know, funny stories. Or is, that's what it all revolves around. And, uh, you know, a colleague of mine, it was a client at the time. He, I now work with him at Pavement Technology, Inc. So, you know, it's a circulatory uh, you know, system for that, too. But uh, really what happened was uh, I got invited to a, a branch meeting, a luncheon, and uh, by, by Ken Holton. Uh, and uh, he was with the city of Tampa. Uh, so I show up and they introduce me. And then the next time I, I decided to make that faithful decision to go back to another lunch and, uh, and I got nominated as secretary of the branch, uh, who knew? So, uh, so my, my saying from that moment on is the first meeting you go to, they introduce you and then the second meeting they nominate you. And that's the, that's the hook. Uh, so that's the, at least the way that APWA works. But the, the best part about that though, is that in my you know career over these years with APWA and beyond, is you know you have to get involved and participate uh, to to win, and so we, we all want to win. We all want to help. Uh, we want want to feel like we're we're doing like we talked about adding value. And to yeah. do that, uh, we have to step up and volunteer and and get involved right away. And that's that's what I did uh, pretty much immediately upon arriving in uh, Florida. Yeah, I was telling you a story about here in Illinois. They were trying to rope me in which I'm totally all about uh, into APWA here in Illinois. And uh, Dan Kalp was like, come drink, you know, have a drink and then let's yeah. talk. And then I'm like, I'm just going to get roped into this one. So oh, yeah, here he goes. <laughs> that's good advice to anyone that's also going to be a business development, you know, want to help out and be involved in our communities, get it, get active in these organizations like you did. And you, yeah. uh, you were, uh, looks like president or involved for like 14 years now and still kind of involved. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it's it's actually like uh, twenty one or so now. Um, yeah. um, so it's been a, a long uh, process, and you know it, it's been fun. I mean, I, I I don't do it for the recognition. That's to to be clear. It's exciting to get, um, but I I certainly didn't start off. You know, hey, let me see if I can you know uh, get some plaques on the wall. Uh, that happens right. after you you know put in the hard work. And so um, I've always just thought of it as. If there's something that they that they could get out of my involvement, I'm going to push my involvement hard and and do what I can to to uh, promote what they're trying to accomplish and do what I can. And so after that, the recognition comes. And the other thing that's fun about recognition, honestly, is is when you're not looking for it, right? I mean, it, right. who 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 can't you know fill in a nomination and nominate themselves? I mean, there's there's no fun in that. Like, what you want to do is be patient and let the recognition come. And that's always been my philosophy is I'm not looking for uh, accolades or uh, awards or any of that. They come because people recognize that there's been some value added there. And and so that's what one of the highlights of my, you know, whole career has been, you know, getting those, uh, you know, accolades because it's a, a validation that, that somebody liked what I, you know, helped with. Right. How did the PWD roundtable start? That was during my term as uh, president of the chapter in uh, 2012, 2013. And we were noticing that we weren't getting as many decision makers for the Florida Chapter Expo. Uh, that's our annual meeting, much like PWX is, but to Florida. Um, and so we decided, you know, hey, let's let's try to encourage that by offering something for the public works directors where they can have a closed uh, you know, session that's only for directors and really give them a chance to network with each other, you know, tackle some of the most challenging problems they might be uh, addressing at the time, and gives the ability for, like, let's say, new directors um, or folks who haven't been in that position very long uh, to really glean information from some of those KG veterans that have been uh, at it for a long period of time. Uh, we're blessed to have uh, a lot of those types of leaders in Florida a lot of previous top 10 recipients. So there's a lot of that, uh, uh, you know, brain power in the room. So in that first um, uh, difference between the, you know, previous year and the first year we did it, we saw basically a fourfold increase in the number of directors who came to the expo. And that just continued uh, to where we were getting, you know, as many as, you know, 50, 60 directors at the round table. 
Um, and it, it vacillates, you know, it depends on where the conference is at and some are a little bit better attended based on, you know, uh, geography. Um, so, but it, it's been a very big success. And then back in 2014, we took that to PWX um, and uh, have done the International Poll Works Director Roundtable for eight years. Uh, so it's been a, a lot of fun. I moderate it. It's all about them. Uh, it's them interacting. I kind of uh, stoke the fire, as they say, yeah. and let it, you know, roar out of control, hopefully. I love it. So it's been about 27 years you've been doing this. Yeah, it's dead. yeah thank you for making me feel old right now. <laughs> no, I, that's amazing. Look, it's wisdom we gain, learning, you know, helping, uh, bringing community. So experience now is more important than ever yeah. because – if you look at the way our industry is, it's the lack of laborers, right? You know, labor shortage right now. We have a lack of engineers. We have so much work that we just can't keep up. And, you know, bringing experience like yours would help mentor or, you know, uh, guide a younger professional wants to move up in the industry and, and, and really kind of streamline their process by your experience, really, is what I look that's, at it as. That's definitely true. Definitely yeah. true. Mentorship is is so vitally important. And, and we need to have that next generation that's engaged. They learn a different way than we did. Right. Uh, they, they absorb material differently. And so they need to be exposed in a number of different, uh, you know, ways. And so I think, you know, if anything came from COVID, there was a few things that did come, but, but I think just, you know, that realization that web-based has been very powerful um, and that the, the, the newer generations like that kind of learning, you know, process, um, that's one of it. I mean, you know, we have to, you know, be adaptable. Uh, and so that's one of the things that I've learned over, over the long haul from the 90s to, to now the 2020s. It's, it, that's been one of the big changes is just the different uh, platforms that are available like this one. I mean, I, I never would have imagined uh, I, no one knew what a, what a, a podcast or, you know, uh, any of this stuff was back in the 90s. So, right. Yeah, everything's changing. The whole digital revolution is, is ever since COVID awesome. it just set us in a different direction. So everything's you know, now I can connect with you. You can connect with me. We can talk about our experiences. We can share those things to millions of people, whoever wants to see it on all these social channels that are out there. And I think you're, you're, you pointed out a good thing is we need to utilize those channels to attract those professionals to what we do in infrastructure because we're so out of sight, out of mind. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So I, I didn't know if you had anything else to say to that, but, um, but one of the biggest things is, you know, your experience is very helpful to a lot of these young professionals. And that's why I do this is I want to bring more uh, guys like yourself that have been in the trenches, know the industry, know what's going on and, and then talking about it. So that's right. Well, and even seasoned professionals, right? So, True. you know, a lot of the folks that, that are, you know, kind of the, that uh, uh, baby boomer generation, or maybe a little laughed after that, like me, the older Gen Xers, you know, they may not be deploying some of the strategies. They may not be on LinkedIn as much, um, it's a great way to attract younger uh, generations to your uh, public works uh, agency or your company uh, is to engage. Uh, that's how we, you know, got, you know, LinkedIn. Uh, right. on it. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's important. Uh, and so, you know, you, you have to go through that process of, of really putting yourself out there now. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, you know, showing that, uh, that you've, you know, got, you know, no fear of showing vulnerabilities, for instance, uh, you know, sharing some of these things, you know, even if that's your mistakes or failures, you, you got to uh, feel comfortable about sharing those to to really, you know, grow and, and, and become what you can become. So, yeah. Speaking of sharing, what is one of the most challenging stories throughout your 27 years that that you can kind of tell the audience about and what you've learned from it? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I, I wish I had less, less to draw on because I'd, I'd be able to pop one off uh, you know, very quickly. <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, it probably goes back into the transition from my, my job with pavement technology to my previous job. Um, okay. There was, you know, kind of this, uh, um, you know, vacuum of, of some of the you know, leadership and some of the things that were, that were uh, available, you know, at our previous company. And uh, it was just turmoil, honestly. And, and when you're having to live under that uh, and, and deal with it, you are you get put in a position to where you have to pick sides or play politics, which I I refused to do uh, right. is really pick sides and get into that, get sucked into some owners, you know, kind of battles. Um, and so it put me in a, in a predicament. But what I found was that 
through that process by not, uh, I guess, you know, kind of getting, uh, you know, lazy with my ethical, you know, uh, my, with my ethics, uh, that, that it, I ended up in the right spot. So it, it was very tumultuous at the time. And it was just like a lot of like back and forth. Uh, but because I refused to kind of, uh, uh, you know, bend to that uh, easy way out of, right. of picking sides that I just said, you know, I, I'm not going to be a party to that. Um, ultimately, uh, the company, you know, didn't uh, didn't survive in Florida. Um, and so or, or chose to kind of pull out and shut down. Uh, and so that's what really uh, led me to where I am now, which I feel much more comfortable is, is a, a, a huge opportunity. It has been a huge opportunity. It will continue to be. Uh, and so I think that the biggest thing is just keep your focus on that high ethical, moral standard, moral rectitude, uh, and good things will happen. It may not feel like that at the time, but you must you know, stay true to yourself uh, and and maintain you know a high ethical standard uh, for yourself and and that's the that the best way to survive for long periods of time in this industry. So, well, thanks for sharing that because that that's a relatable story that a lot of people are going through uh, in this change of uh, I think the times you know culture leadership yep. you know we're I I've been in the same situation where I just didn't I don't do well under like corporate and certain drama and things like that. If you try and put a yes. bunch of people together that just don't mesh, the culture's off and then it just throws the whole organization off and it becomes a spiraling, you know, path of death. I mean, it's, it's terrible it to use, that. but that's really what it, it turns out to be. Go ahead. It is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not good. And, and you can't, you know, you, you can't be forced into that situation. You can be, but don't let yourself be, you know, stay true to yourself. Uh, if it's not a place that's going to remain positive, then you need to be somewhere else. And so that's the, the, the biggest takeaway is just uh, you have to surround yourself with, you know, positivity and give, uh, you know, the, the same positive that you're getting. And if you're not getting that positive reinforcement or you're getting micromanaged or, or something else, it doesn't feel right. Uh, you got to listen to that and uh, you may have to make a difficult decision. But, um, you know, uh, if we do what is easy, our life will be hard. If we do what is hard, our life will be easy. That kind of Les Brown quote. Uh, so, you know, I try to always do the the, the hard thing. And uh, and just the other thing is, uh, I'll tell you another one, criticism, because I, I get uh, yeah. thrown throw those around. But um, back, one of the few things I took away from like elementary science uh, was uh, that erosion is the most powerful force of nature. And I use that a lot because honestly, a lot of times, uh, you know, the, the, the will to resist, uh, you know, your, uh, you know, what your efforts are. And I, and I use it jokingly, of course, I'm not going to, uh, you know, just erode away at them. But, but if there's somebody that's been resistant over the years, uh, you know, that erosion of time can be a powerful force. And, and that's why I always say, you know, at some point or another, we're going to do business together. I, I feel confident in it because if I stay true to myself and I add as much value as I can and I help them, then they'll understand that and they'll see and appreciate it. And, and, and eventually they're going to be like, God, you know, he's just got so much there. Let me, let me see what we can do. And, and it'll feel right at that point. Yeah. And people want to work with like-minded individuals yeah. like that growth mindset to just want to move forward. And, oh yeah, you know, absolutely. And I have fun. Like I'm a fun yeah. guy. Like I, I, you know, I'll, I'll throw it out there. I'm, I'm just as likely to, uh, to go up on stage and perform a, a, a rap song, uh, or, or poetry. Like I'm not above any of it. Like I'll, I'll engage any of that. Uh, and so you look hard enough, you'll, you'll see some of that out in the, uh, out in the, World Wide Web, Chad. I'll leave Love it at that. <laughs> yeah, you're you're a poet, and I didn't know it. Yeah, I'm, I'm right. Poets didn't know it. it Rapper. <laughs> yeah, everything, man. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. All right. So uh, that's that's go back to like infrastructure, technology, AI, all this stuff that's happening yep. now in, the, in our world of infrastructure. It's a, a adopting technologies in government and things like that is it's really a struggle and and this is probably a question that you and i didn't talk about the first time but i'm, I'm curious on your thoughts about it because we have firms engineers that guide some of these departments of, of where they should take their infrastructure and how it should be repaired um and they also are kind of like the gatekeepers in certain situations so i'm curious in your thoughts of like is that one of the the barriers to entry for us in public works uh, just to try and get to the right people so that we can get the right technologies and solutions to them? 
it, it can be. It can yeah. be definitely. I mean, uh, the the biggest thing is that uh, you know if you're if you're looking at what you need to do and what could be causing an issue is that you know uh, if you're just having a barrier, it could be that you're you're not in front of the decision maker, um, you know, or or they don't believe that that you can solve the problem. Uh, it's typically one of those two things. It, it's it could be that there's no money, but normally when people have settled on the fact that they desperately need something, they will find a way uh, to to get the money, uh, the funding. It may not be right away. Uh, so if you're just you know in a sense, and this can be for uh, public works in trying to you know engage elected officials. I mean, I talk about uh, sales a lot as it relates to public works directors need to be able to sell the elected officials on what they want to do, uh, just as much as uh, somebody like uh, you or I would need to sell a poll works director on a uh, product or service. Um, So it's absolutely critical that you are able to transfer that belief uh, that this will solve their problem. If you can't do that, then it's it's unlikely you you will be able to. Ultimately, until uh, they make that purchasing decision, uh, you know, will they ultimately be able to solve that problem? I mean, it's not going to solve itself. So as far as AI, you know, all of these things, they're all just tools that enable us to do it uh, faster, better, cheaper. And the thing that we have to do is is be able to look at that and say, hey, uh, you know, these are the new ways of doing it. Uh, let me educate myself. Um, you know, if you're the poll works director, let me educate myself on how this might, you know, help us uh, to do our jobs. They have to do more with less now. We we all have to. So if that means using chat GPT, uh, or if that means, um, you know, using some of these other technologies, as it relates to what I do, it means, you know, not just doing worse first on your pavements, don't just mill and resurface, like deploy these alternative pavement uh, preservation processes uh, to extend the life of your overall network. That's key. And so, uh, you know, that that fear uh, and fear is false evidence appearing real. Uh, that's what it stands for. So, so getting rid of that fear and just understanding that, you know, hey, this is just new. It's new to me. It's not new, likely, unless you just happen upon the first time they've ever done something, which is unlikely in public works. And we usually get things further on down the road. Right. Um, so, the fact is that that we have to give the the you know agency and the and the decision makers that education, uh, the the information that they need to make that informed decision and, and to have them feel comfortable that they're making the right decision. Yeah, you uh, brought up a great points there. Uh, one thing was the decision makers within the government that say uh, public works directors has to get buy-in from the managers, the city managers, yeah. things like that. It's it's a process uh, that everyone's kind of got to buy into it and you got to head up, have a top and bottom approach to it, right? It's like coming in from both ways. That's one thing I've always learned in uh, this process is, you know, even if you give them the tools, sometimes they can't articulate it to the next level yeah. and you have to make sure you get the right people to that meeting so that you can bring that value that we're talking about and, and that solution that but could maybe save them a ton of time and money. I mean, that's, that's the, yeah, if you do it right, you are saving them a, t- a ton of time, time and money. I mean, that, that is what it's all about. It's uh, it's giving them the ability to find that solution. Um, and that's why you have to do some fact finding and understand, ask questions first. Like you need to be asking a lot of questions uh, right. and the, and they need to do the same thing. Like uh, the, the answer is in the question. I know that yeah. scene sounds backwards, but but the answer is in asking the right questions and asking the hard questions. Um, That's you know, like like how much of this, uh, you know, did I just, uh, you know, tell you that you even believe? Like, yeah. you know, uh, uh, why would you why would you even do this? Yeah. Um, because at that point, then they're reinforcing it. Hopefully they say, you know, I, I think uh, I think most of what you said, if if most of what you said is true, then it's going to be a good fit for us. And then you can relay that. that yes. I mean, I, you know. To, to my knowledge, I, everything I've told you is true. So this should right. be good to go. So, yeah, that's uh, very important. The way you describe that is uh, to make sure that we get the buy-in from everybody. Yeah, it's pretty much what it comes down to, and, and they're going to see sure. the value and the the significance of it and, and transform. When you mentioned GPT, I mean, we're looking at the future of specification writing. The oh yeah, of automation of a lot of things that, that are procurement. I mean, we talked about that yeah, procurement, the future of that. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. And then, and then we yeah. were talking and you and I were talking about like triage and roads. Oh yeah. Things like that. So 
and that's that's your wheelhouse but but that's the technologies like lidar things like that that are coming yeah. out so so what what do you think is going on with the roads in america right now oh, wow uh not enough uh, <laughs> i i think uh so, or too much is depend on which you angle go. you're looking at uh i mean they're, they're deteriorating rapidly um uh, the, the problem is that uh for one thing we have been underfunded um, you know, we, there's there's no way to to, to look at uh, the the current state of affairs and say that we're appropriately funding our infrastructure. Uh, certainly, our surface infrastructure. Uh, gas tax is broken. Uh, you know, we're getting less. Uh, cars are are traveling further, or they don't need gas at all. As as case in point with the EVs. Um, and so, we are in the most challenging time we've ever been in in infrastructure. Uh, and, and we talked about this, uh, you know, if you if you look at the sewer system or you look at uh, really the electrical grid, right. every aspect of infrastructure is is really in a traumatic time. And the only way that we can get ourselves out of this is through uh, some some creativity, um, some risk. Uh, we are going to have to take a step into the unknown and use s- strategies that we haven't used before. And we have to do so. And we, we also have to be proactive you know, we have been for many, many years, like they would repair potholes. Okay, that's a reaction to a failure. Uh, we have to be able to be proactive about it. So get to it before it fails. Or hopefully now with AI, we can be more predictive to where we even know when that thing is going to show up. Um, and we know based on age and condition, and we go in and we understand all the environmental aspects of what's causing this sun, water, traffic all of these things that damage our roadways. And so we know that by preserving these pavements and getting ahead of it and and taking care of it, that the math will work. If you just do worse first and you wait till something fails and then try to rehabilitate or reconstruct it, there is not enough money in this world to, uh, to be able to handle that. Yeah. And, and all the promise of, of these, uh, you know, full self-driving autonomous vehicles, that only works if we have a, a pavement that's in good enough condition to not, you know, uh, damage the EV or, or whatever as it's driving along, right? right. Um, you know, you probably are going to have a tough time, you know, getting the car to drive itself if it can't see the line striping, uh, you know, because that's failing. If there's potholes in the middle of the road or all over the road, it's failing. All these things are predicated on us having good infrastructure. We can't enjoy the benefits of and the productivity bump of it driving itself if the pavement's falling apart. Right. So we have to, you know, invest in in this uh, infrastructure, and it has to be, you know, efficient, effective, and, and safe for everybody. Yeah. You can tell you've been around for 27 years. That's for sure, Chris. Yeah, well, I'm on my soapbox. I'm I'm standing on it right now. No, it's good stuff. It's good information. Uh, So let's talk about, real quick, uh, pavement technologies. We've got a couple, like four or five minutes left. Yeah. Let's get into eat small, things like that. That's that's, that's impressive. I want to hear more. it's exciting. Uh, we're we're really excited about this technology, Chad. I think one of the things uh, after discovering uh, that that we would be able to use uh, a, an additive to a, a process that we've already been using, asphalt rejuvenation, um, using a maltine based uh, rejuvenator called Reclamite. Uh, but by using titanium dioxide, we enabled the road uh, to photoreact. Uh, basically, it's called phot- photocatalysis. And that's like photosynthesis, but what's happening is the sun is is impacting the pavement that's been treated with titanium, and that titanium enables the pavement to, uh, for lack of a better you know term, eat smog. It captures CO two and NOx emissions. Uh, it uh, reflects the urban heat, uh, the UV radiation from the sun that causes the urban heat island effect, uh, and we found that it can decompose microplastic pollution. And, and it also moves water off of the pavement, uh, you know, quite a bit faster. So all of these things are, are really exciting because they're the, the source of a lot of our environmental challenges come from our transportation sector. Right. It's, the, right. it's the biggest contributor of uh, photochemical smog and, and air pollution. Uh, it's the biggest contributor of microplastic pollution. About 85 percent comes from tire and brake wear. Hmm. And EVs don't solve that. They're heavier, and so they create more microplastic debris. Uh, but all this gets into our air, uh, gets into our uh, uh, waterways, uh, and so all of this causes some substantial problems. Uh, if you look at climate change, obviously tracked uh, to CO two. So by capturing, you know, that using this new technology, uh, we're we're just super excited. I mean, the, the uh, 
uh, levels are amazing. It's uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent NOx and CO2 capture uh, on both asphalt and concrete. Uh, so the, it's it's really could be a game changer for public works and, and gives public works the ability to become a part of the solution for mm-hmm. a lot of these, you know, uh, real uh, world challenges that, that we frankly don't have a, a good answer for. I mean, planting a tree, uh, you know, you'd have to plant a 20 acre forest to do the same thing as, as about one mile of treated road. Um, and we just don't have room to, to plant that many forests in our, in our city environment, for instance, our urban right. landscape. So there's just a lot that we're learning. We're, we're learning as we go. Um, so it's, uh, it's exciting. And I think, uh, once we can kind of unlock some of the uh, federal funding mechanisms and some of the mechanisms, even of using, uh, corporate ESG, uh, philosophies to, to uh, go after as well. So I, I think it's, uh, we're on a, a, a real cusp. So, uh, PTI is uh, excited and it's one of the primary roles that I have now is to, you know, educate, uh, both public works, elected officials, all those, uh, key aspects on, on what this technology can, can do. So. Well, it certainly sounds like amazing technology that can really help our communities and keep everybody, you know, just in a better environment, so to speak, for what they're breathing, uh, for sure. One thing that I, and we're out of time, but I want to touch on this one. You said EV vehicles and plastic pollutants and things like that. That's interesting. Like, what are we looking at here? Is there there more information that we don't know? Sure. I mean, if you think about it, uh, these uh, EVs, the batteries are very heavy. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the, the knocks or one of the things that, uh, that people talk about is, geez, you go through tires faster, uh, brakes, they're regenerative brakes. So you're, you're going to have some braking, you know, wear. Um, and then especially as we get into these uh, EV semis, which are uh, allowed to actually be heavier, uh, over 80,000 pounds, they're going to generate more of these microplastic, uh, you know, they call them road area microplastic particles. And those become uh, almost worse, uh, are worse uh, than just uh, uh, NOx or CO2 emissions uh, because it's particulate uh, matter, which uh, gets into our lungs, gets into our food supply, our waterways. They're finding them even in Antarctica, for crying out loud. So uh, these things are everywhere and uh, and they're toxic as well. So they're going to cause a big challenge. So just because we're maybe transitioning from fossil fuel uh, to EV, um, it doesn't mean that our uh, air and, and water pollution uh, problems are going to completely go away. They're just going to to morph into a different problem that we have to solve. So that's uh, interesting topic to maybe yeah. discuss at a later date because that's yeah. just moving from one problem to another the way it sounds. But I mean, we are evolving, but you know, fossil fuels is fossil fuels. We've been using those for decades and centuries, sure. a century now, almost uh, at this point. But uh, this is good stuff, Chris. I truly appreciate the insight. Yeah, on, sure. it's hard to scare you. Yeah. And, and roads and yeah, just all that is really good stuff. So again, thank you for joining us. How can people get a hold of you? Definitely. I mean, uh, best way is probably uh, C Evers. So C E V E R S at pavetechinc.com. Uh, certainly look for me on LinkedIn. I'm very active there. And and then, uh, you know, you can just go with the old style digits to 727-638-1699. So, uh, you know, that's those are the best ways to catch me and and uh, look for me in those uh, in those arenas. Love it, man. Well, thanks again for joining me. And I look Absolutely, forward to the yes. next time we get to meet and hang out and talk. Definitely. To I can't wait. All right. Have a good weekend. Excellent. You too, Chad. Thank you for listening to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. We hope that this show brought you some insight on relevant topics within the infrastructure world. Please join us every two weeks on Tuesday for the next episode. If you're interested in being a guest on this podcast, please set up a 15-minute interview with your host at calendly.com slash Chad Smeltzer. Infrastructure is crumbling and the problems are only getting worse. The pressure to find solutions is hot. Let's talk about why American cities have no water, no electricity, and no money to fix their infrastructure problems. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast, hosted by Chad Smeltzer.